Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled Employing Hot Melt Extrusion, a Cost-Effective Method to Increase Solubility, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Dennis Durumi, Professor in Pharmaceutical Technology and Process Engineering at University of Greenwich, and Dr. Marguerite Richter, Pharma Application Specialist at Thermo Fisher Scientific. My name is Stephen Edwards, and I'll be your moderator. Now, please allow me to introduce our first presenter. Dennis Durumi is a pro uh, professor in pharmaceutical technology and process engineering at the universities of Kent and Greenwich. His research focuses on the development and characterization of drug products by using continuous manufacturing process such as hot melt extrusion and spray drying. His research also explores the use of quality by design approaches and process analytical tools for process optimization. He has industrial experience on R&D of solid dosage forms, technology transfer, and scale-up. Due to his expertise, he led several EU-funded projects as a principal investigator, and he has established industrial collaborators for the development of extruded products. He is the head of Medway School of Pharmacy and has joined the editorial boards of more than 10 international peer-reviewed journals, including the Wiley's editorial board for the series in Advances in Pharmaceutical Technology. He has published more than 120 peer-reviewed publications, including 100 full papers, four book chapters, and two books. I will now be handing over to our first presenter. Welcome to Dr. Durumi. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. So today I'm going to uh, present pharmaceutical whole method extrusion uh, as a cost-effective method to increase uh, solubility. Uh, so the outline of my presentation will include uh, a quick introduction to whole method extrusion, uh, an introduction on prediction of drug polymer miscibility, and uh, eventually I will uh, present uh, uh, a few case studies for increased drug dissolution. Uh, before we go to the main presentation, presentation, I would like to let you know that uh, our group is located in Medway Campus, one of the three of the University of Greenwich, and we have uh, a multidisciplinary group where our research focuses mainly on uh, continuous manufacturing and process analytical tools, uh, again, mainly using the whole method exclusion or spray drying, uh, medical devices fabricated by 3D printing, and uh, finally, the last area of our research in our technology mainly uh, where we use a range of nanoparticles mainly uh, for uh, uh, cancer treatment. And uh, without further delay, I will uh, uh, give you a quick introduction on extrusion processing. So it was first patented in uh, 1797 for making lead pipes, and it was just in 1979 where following year used extrusion for sustained release of uh, pellets. So over the last 25 years, extrusion process received enormous interest for pharmaceutical industry in a wide range of applications, such as whole melt extrusion, uh, melt extrusion, granulation, and co-crystallization. And uh, uh, however, uh, extrusion has been uh, known for many years for the increase uh, of solubility of water soluble drugs through the formation of uh, solid dispersions. And uh, there is a wide range of solid dispersions depending on the drug uh, physical state uh, within the polymer matrix. I will not go in much detail, but it is important to know that before any experimentation, without wasting time and materials, there are always uh, there is a way to identify suitable drug polymer combinations. So a very common approach is to calculate the drug polymer visibility using the uh, fan Krevel and Hofstra equations. Uh, combine them with the hazard solubility parameters. So typical examples are depicted on the two tables. As you can see, we have the theoretical values uh, between uh, uh, of uh, the drug, drug uh, substance and polymers. And uh, a theoretical approach is that uh, if the difference between the solubility parameters of the two substances is less than seven, then the materials are remissible. This is a well-known approach which has been applied successfully for the development of solid dispersions. However, this is not always uh, good enough, and uh, in our group we develop uh, a new approach where we use molecular modeling. So briefly, we calculate the total energy with respect to all atomic coordinates. This includes the sum of the electronic and repulsion energies between the nuclei and the electrons. A major advantage uh, with this approach is that we can 
identify the intrinsic strength of fragile bonds and interaction between the functional groups. So molecular modeling is a very effective tool to estimate the right polymer visibility. And another uh, final advantage of this approach is that we can create a database so any new material we incorporate can be used to predict uh, uh, the uh, miscibility of a drug and a polymer. That could be a drug or could be a new uh, polymeric material. So there is um, um, uh, hormone exclusion is not always a straightforward approach, uh, especially for the development of pharmaceutical approach uh, products. So we can see now in this uh, diagram that there is a range of physical uh, processing parameters, materials, and quality attributes that need to be identified for the development of the final product. So uh, just to uh, uh, let you know that uh, uh, although hot mixture might sound uh, a simple process to uh, a lot of people, it's not. Uh, and we, can, uh, we have to take into account more or less all these uh, different parameters depending on the stage of the development uh, we are. And uh, now I will uh, start presenting the case studies where we use uh, uh, extrusion to increase solubility of drug substances. So in the first one, I present a range of, uh, of uh, HME processing of water in solid drugs for the development of solid dispersions with increased dissolution rates. As you can see on the table, we have a range of drugs in polymer grades which have been processed at various drug loadings uh, to form solid dispersions. Uh, it's obvious that the, the loadings vary from 20 to 40%. And uh, the extruded strands were further processed using downstream equipment to receive the final material in the form of, uh, of uh, powders. So the, uh, there was a full characterization uh, of, uh, of the final uh, extruded products. And uh, as you can see in this slide, the, the LCM images show that the extruded powders present the same morphology, while sieve analysis showed a very uniform particle size distribution. And uh, further physical chemical analysis, which I'm not going to present, demonstrated that drug substances were either in amorphous uh, state or mo were molecularly dispersed within the polymer uh, uh, matrix. So in the next slide, there is a typical example of uh, extruded ibuprofen uh, samples. You can see the dissolution profiles. So in the left graph, we see the dissolution rates of ibuprofen uh, process with uh, uh, different pharmaceutical grade polymers and combined with the bulk substance. And, uh, and we can see that the increase in dissolution was uh, quite dramatic, uh, quite significant compared to the uh, bulk ibuprofen. In the right graph, we can observe the dissolution rates of the extruded formulations in comparison to a marketed product called uh, Merklets. This is a well-known, it's a blockbuster, well-known in, uh, uh, in the market. So we can see that the increase of the dissolution is, is obvious in both cases. But what is interesting, uh, uh, the interesting outcome was that uh, the higher the drug loadings uh, uh, used in this uh, process, the faster the solution rates we obtain. And this was due to the plasticization effect of the uh, ibuprofen uh, in the methacrylate uh, polymers. And uh, in the next slide, there's a, uh, another example, again, uh, where we, this time we have indomethacine, another uh, well-studied drug and famotidine, which were processed to make solid dispersions with various drug loadings and uh, different uh, polymers. And again, we can uh, uh, clearly observe that uh, there was a significant increase of the dissolution rates for all solid dispersions, irrespectively of the polymer or the drug loading. So in addition uh, to that, uh, uh, for the case of indomethacine, we, have an, uh, we can see again uh, that indomethacine acts as a plasticizer resulting for certain polymers and results in the fast dissolution rates for high drug loadings. Uh, and this is a, a very unique uh, uh, feature of uh, which we can, uh, has been observed also from other researchers uh, when using the whole metal extrusion. And um, a major advantage of whole metal extrusion is, that the, is the fact that there is an enormous amount of polymers that can be processed. So in that case here, we can see the utilization of HME for control release applications by processing indomethacine again with uh, a polymer called Aquat, which is a pH-dependent polymer grade. So at this time, we don't want to have a very uh, fast dissolution rate right from the beginning, but the formulation was designed to induce two hours lag time and then fast dissolution rates in alkaline media. So the study demonstrated that, uh, a combined effect of uh, co-processing 
a little bit in the polymer. So in that case, we, we combine uh, 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 the the HPMC grade uh, with uh, uh, a lipid uh, material, and uh, we can see that uh, after the pH uh, uh, change, uh, two hours later, we have uh, almost complete uh, uh, drug dissolution with uh, less than one hour. So this is uh, another example where we can twist the formulation and play with the polymer properties in order to produce different uh, release profiles and different release uh, patterns. Okay, an excellent example of uh, HME processing is the capabilities uh, of the extrusion process to form nanoparticles. In this study, we had a very careful selection of a miscible drug polymer blend, uh, which provides excellent quality of extrusive products. This can be seen in the right photo which, uh, which was taken during extrusion, and we can see the, the strands uh, uh, they are produced. The most interesting finding was that the micronized powders dissolve rapidly in the dissolution bath to produce a milky nano suspension. This is a very rare phenomenon that has been, uh, uh, and the obtained nanoparticles were measured by laser diffraction, uh, where we found them in the range of 650 to 750 nanometers. You can see the laser diffraction uh, uh, patterns. The nanoparticles gave a very fast dissolution rate of gold and solid drugs. Unfortunately, I cannot reveal more information due to the confidential nature of, uh, of this work, but it was a very uh, excellent example where uh, 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 proper extrusion processing of a drug with a miscible polymer gave us uh, uh, generated very small uh, parts in, in the submicron area. So now I'm going to the uh, another uh, uh, case study where we uh, have extrusion process, and that was uh, actually it was extrusion granulation, uh, and was used to form granules. Uh, the aim was to, to use extrusion to form granules, but also to increase the dissolution rates of water and solid drugs. Of course, the dissolution enhancement is not uh, of the same level, like solid dispersions, as we saw before, but it can be at satisfactory levels. So in this study, we apply the quality by design approach to optimize the granulation process by implementing a design of experiment. So the aim was to investigate the effect of formulation composition, uh, uh, but also to uh, investigate the processing parameters and understand uh, complex effects. Uh, of course, for the sake of the study, we did it a bit uh, uh, more simple. So you can see here, this is the, the, um, uh, the the design, that is a table of uh, design of uh, experiment, and here we introduce a novel inorganic excipient called Fujigalin, combined with a, a cellulose grade. Uh, so the binder amount and the ratio of the granulate liquid to the solid mass were taken into account, and uh, we studied the effect of these attributes uh, and measured against the ibuprofen dissolution rates, the granule mean particle size, and the loss of drying. So as you can see, in the last three columns, these are the measurable uh, outcomes uh, out of the 11 uh, formulations that uh, we derived from the design of the experiment. So we, inco we incorporate these uh, values into the system. We analyze and we analyze the uh, the uh, experiments by using the software. And uh, I will not go into much detail about the design of experiments, but um, eventually, by we analyzing the data we were able to identify the critical formulation aspects for the improvement of the extruded granules. So the effect of each formulation parameter varied and affected to a different extent uh, to the dissolution, particle size, and loss of uh, drying. Eventually, some of the design formulations presented very fast dissolution rates. Um, also, we line, uh, uh, which I saw in a, uh, I'll present to you in a moment, uh, this is the uh, last part of the study where we, we applied offline analysis of the extruded granules and we proved the presence of uh, both amorphous and crystalline ibuprofen within the, the granular uh, particles. And this is something we anticipate because, as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't have a, 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 a whole med um, application where, or whole med extrusion processing, uh, so we expect that the part of the drug will be uh, still crystalline, will remain still crystalline. And um, we can see here, these are typical dissolution profiles of the ibuprofen granules. And we can see for some of these formulations, the release was uh, quite uh, fast. So in, within uh, uh, 120 minutes, the dissolution range varies from 70 to 90 percent, which actually was a good, uh, um, a good effect uh, of or a good use of home extrusion. And uh, 
I'll go to the next study where uh, hormone oxygen has been proved an excellent uh, uh, process to synthesize high purity co crystals in a solid state in the absence of organic solvents. So we have investigated uh, um, uh, it, it, it is, um, uh, the process is, uh, is very common, has been used for uh, several uh, colleagues, and uh, uh, it's, uh, is, uh, it's a different part of our group where we synthesize co crystals as an alternative uh, approach to increase the dissolution. Uh, rate, uh, where the, the new form is in a single phase and is obtained by combining a drug and a, and a material which is called coformer. And uh, although excision has been proved a, a, a very excellent process, we, uh, we are able to run a significant amount of uh, studies in our group, and we investigated both single and twin screw extrusion process uh, to identify the right temperature profile, the screw speed, the feed rate, and the screw configurations, which eventually all these uh, processing parameters play an important role in the quality of the synthesized products. Uh, so briefly, we can see in this slide, we can see some ACM images. So we saw the effect of the temperature in the morphology of the co-crystals, and uh, also the uh, X-ray diffraction. We see the variations in the crystal lattice of the uh, extruded products. In this slide, we can see uh, the uh, run also uh, an offline characterization, offline and inline characterization of the process materials across the extrusion barrels. So, on the uh, left part, we can see the X ray analysis where we observe that uh, a complete transformation takes place uh, during the process. So, these are, um, uh, these are sounds collected at different stages of the extrusion uh, barrel, and slowly we can see the formation of the end product, which is the uh, co-crystal of carbamazepine and uh, saccharine. At the same time, we combine the um, uh, inline analysis using the NIR Antari system, where we can use it for quality purposes, but also we can use it to identify the drug, uh, uh, the, the, the drug of formal interactions. So further analysis in that case uh, is, uh, is, was done by using the second derivative of the NIR spectra. And, and more specific, specifically, we detect the changes in the peak intensity, but also the shifts of the, in different wavelengths. So all this combined information from the inline analysis can provide valuable information uh, of what really happens during the extrusion process uh, while we uh, have the formation of the co-crystals. And uh, in this slide, we can see uh, on the left part, we can see the dissolution uh, profiles of, uh, of uh, different uh, co-crystals. So we observe that uh, the co-crystal dissolution is not only affected from the extruded product, but also from downstream processing, so such as milling or the addition of excipients. So in the left graph, we can see the different dissolution profiles of indomethacin saccharine uh, co-crystals this time. Uh, which uh, were uh, uh, made, we, we used the dissolution profiles of, uh, we estimated the dissolution profiles of the S-made co-crystals or co-crystals, the same co-crystals after milling process where we reduce the particle size or even after the addition of different excipients and we compare that of course with the bulk substance. So it can be observed that uh, the milling can further increase the dissolution rates of the, of the co-crystals which is something we expect. We have uh, uh, more surface uh, exposed in the dissolution uh, uh, media, but also we can see that the uh, materials we use uh, in, uh, to fill the capsules might cause a slow dissolution rate. So it is very important. The point from these uh, uh, dissolution studies was to, uh, of course, provide evidence that uh, co-crystallization mediated by holomate extrusion can increase the dissolution of uh, water soluble drugs, but at the same time, we have to be very careful of how we uh, process our samples on what kind of formulations we, we use. On the right diagram, we can see a complete continuous extrusion process for the processing of, uh, of co-crystal. This is something we have done in our uh, lab. And uh, as you can see, the whole process was, con was coupled, the extrusion process was coupled with uh, uh, PAT tools. These were NIR probes or uh, uh, particle size uh, probes. We can measure the particle size of the co-crystals or the blending uh, materials. So eventually, the, uh, the, the final product, the co-crystals blended with uh, the right excipient formulations were fed into a capsule filler where we're able to, to uh, produce 3,000 capsules at the same time. The whole process was, was uh, relatively to scale up, 
and uh, we are able to, in a 60 millimeter extruder, we are able to produce 1.5 kilograms per hour of, uh, uh, of pharmaceutical co-crystals with high purity, which, uh, uh, which was actually uh, close to 99%. And uh, so these were the uh, four cases I presented uh, today, and the idea was to uh, give you a very good uh, um, uh, uh, understanding of how whole metoxidation process can be used to increase the solubility of water and solid drugs. And um, uh, the message today is that uh, HME is an excellent processing technology uh, for water and solid drugs, uh, and the understanding of the processing parameters and quality attributes can help us to uh, develop robust uh, extruded uh, products. And um, whole metal extrusion so far has been employed to commercialize a number of finished drug products in the form of solid dispersion, but there is more to exploit. And uh, uh, having said that, I would like to close my presentation and thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you, Dr. Duramay. Uh, once again, I would like to remind our viewers that there will be a live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. But please feel free to send your questions in at any time during the webinar via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. And we'll go through these at the end of the presentation. Now, please allow me to introduce our second speaker. Dr. Margaret Richer is a pharma application specialist at Thermo Fisher Scientific where she develops new applications for pharmaceutical grade twin screw extruders. She regularly publishes her findings and provides worldwide support to pharmaceutical customers. Dr. Richard's expertise includes international experience with HME twin screw granulation for various pharmaceutical dosage forms, scale up and GMP. Prior to her work at Thermo Fisher Scientific, Dr. Richter was a researcher at the German Aerospace Center Institute of Engineering Thermodynamics in Stuttgart, Germany. There, she focused on thermo, thermochemical engine storage, heat transformation, thermal analysis, and thermodynamic and kinetic reaction models. She earned her PhD degree from the University of Stuttgart. In addition, she became a chemical engineer by training after graduating from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. I will now be handing over to our second presenter. Welcome, Dr. Ingrichia. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So in this presentation, um, I'll be giving you an introduction into hot melt extrusion, which is probably a bit more related to the process itself, so m less to the formulations, but more to the, um, to the technology um, and the setup you need um, to perform this um, process. In general, um, I would like to give you uh, first a uh, introduction related to bioavailability, so how can I actually improve bioavailability. Um, then I'll be talking about hot and extrusion itself and how it functions. I'll be giving you some examples and um, then I'll go, into focus, I'll go into focus on downstream processing. So once you have extruded the material, what is next? And last but not least, I would like to show you some other dosage forms that are also possible with hot melt extrusion. So let's start with improving bioavailability. Um, this is actually, well, the biggest, um, how to say, the, the biggest problem in pharmaceutical development um, that you have low avail bioavailability of a drug. Um, what you see on the right-hand side, you can see um, how many approved drugs are basically in which BCS class. And what you can see here is that most of them are basically BCS class one, uh, sorry, two, which is um, low solubility. Um, so this is the main um, point that needs improvement when you, when you do the formulation and when you think about how to process um, the, um, the formulation. There are different uh, possibilities to improve uh, the solubility. First of all, you can um, do a, you can do amorphous uh, APIs. Secondly, of course, um, nanocrystals are, are very interesting. But what you see here on this chart, it, chart 
is that um, the number of approved drugs increased a lot um, if you consider solid dispersion or lipid formulation. So these are the most important technologies to improve solubility. And solid, di solid dispersions are basically the ones that we will be talking about. So what are solid dispersions? Normally you uh, have an amorphous polymer matrix, which um, yeah, is, is the yeah, matrix for the complete um, formulation. And then within this matrix, you actually incorporate an active ingredient, which can be either crystalline, amorphous, or dissolved in this polymer matrix. And these three different types can basically already improve the solubility of the drug. Um, from a thermodynamic point of view, you could imagine that a crystalline API is very stable. So that's a system that will just stay the way it is um, for a very long time. You might have some crystal growth, but in general, this will be a perfectly thermodynamic stable um, dispersion. If you actually um, succeed to amortize um, your API so that active is like little droplets within the polymer matrix, then you, you, will, you could reach a solid glassy dispersion. And this is something that is um, a metastable product because um, you would, um, this system tends to recrystallize and uh, thus the, you, you could have yeah, a, not, a not stable product in the end. If you finally are able to dissolve the drug, so you could have a glassy solution really, then you have only one phase left, and this is a perfectly stable um, product if you stay below the saturation concentration of the API in the polymer. Um, to know when did I reach actually which kind of dispersion, um, this is, um, there are two possibilities. First of all, it's really easy if you do the extrusion, um, a crystalline, a solid crystalline dispersion will look opaque, so you will have normally a white, white um, extrudate. Whereas on uh, the other two um, dispersions or the solution, basically, are completely translucent. Then you can do the analysis of the product. Of course, um, differential scaling calorimetry is the actually most common um, system to do, to work with. And the difference is if you have two phases, you will have two signals. And of course, if you have one crystalline phase, you will have a melting point plus the glass transition of the polymer. See, of course, if you have the amorphous, um, so the solid glassy dispersion, you will have two glass transition signals. And if you only have this complete, you know, dissolved phase, then you have only one phase, and that means you have only one glass transition. So this is how you can actually distinguish these types. And what you, in most cases, what you would look for is having a completely dissolved system. Right? So how can I reach this? I can make um, this you know, dissolution or this solid dispersion with different technologies. And you have, on, in this um, table, you can see very, you know, four different most common technologies. Freeze drying and supercritical fluid drying are normally quite cost intense and um, not, not very common to use. So the most common technologies here are spray drying and hot melt extrusion. Spray drying is um, state of the art, it's very fast and um, gives you very flexible particle sizes, but you have to work with a solvent. That means you have solvent res residues um, within your product maybe. Um, and you have the whole solvent handling that you have to do. That means that you have to get rid of the solvent once um, you actually did the spray drying process. You have to filter it. You have to have the complete process behind the process. And this is really, really costly. In comparison to that, hot melt extrusion is completely solvent free. So you don't need to find a solvent that fits your um, formulation and you don't have to work with this solvent. It's a completely dust-free process, continuous, and needs only a few processing steps. Furthermore, it's uh, perfectly reproducible, which is also very, very important, um, especially if you think of many batch processes where you have batch-to-batch -batch differences. It's 
something you can easily scale up from a lab scale to a production scale. It has really low costs and really important is it needs really small footprints. So especially um, com in comparison to a spray dryer, which uh, needs a huge amount of space um, within a GMP area, um, this is something that is very small and does not need a lot of space. There are some dis disadvantages though, and I, 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 it's important to be honest here. Hot mold extrusion needs elevated temperatures. If you have a thermal lab label API, that might be an issue. And of course, you need further downstream processing, um, which gives you actually some kind of flexibility also to, um, to go forward here. Okay, so let's go into hot mold extrusion. I'm not going to start from the very beginning with Archimedes, but basically this is where we what it was found that a screw can help you to convey material into one direction. In plastics processing um, and also in food processing, which has been uh, mentioned before, you basically we use extrusion and this kind of screw um, for yeah shaping, melting of, of the material, but basically shaping is the most important point here. Um, limitations of a single screw, as it is shown in this uh, little picture, is that you can imagine if you move the material into one direction and you place a die at the end, you will have quite high pressure build up at that point because this material will fill up the complete screw. Furthermore, it has actually no mixing capabilities, so you basically don't have any um, possibility to um, yeah, mix your material. So if we go into the more modern technology um, where we work with parallel intermeshing and co-rotating screws, we have a lot more flexibility. Basically, this has started in the second half of the 20th century where um, this technology has been used in polymer processing a lot, but more and more in pharmaceutical processing as, as well. And the nice thing is because we have these two screws which are self-wiping and have a high mixing capability, you have the possibility to make the solid dispersion that I mentioned before. You, of course, you melt the polymer, but you actually mix it, you compound it very well. And um, furthermore, if you just work without a dye, without the shaping of the material at the end, you can perform an agglomeration of the material, which has been mentioned before by Professor Dormitis as well. Um, so, how does this work? Well, hot melt extrusion combines thermal and mechanical energy, so you basically work above the glass transition of the polymer, so you kind of, you could say you melt the polymer, so you have a really, you know, viscous melt which you work with, and um, what we do is basically we feed powders or pellets, um, pellet materials, into the extruder. We can do split feeding as it's shown in the sketch um, on, that, on that slide. But you could also work with a blend of a material. And so you basically feed this into the screws. And in the screws, you mix, knead, convey the material, perform the melting. And at the end of the screws, you see we have a die where you actually have the shaping. And this functions like a bottleneck. So Basically, the size of the little hole you have there determines the residence time of um, your material within the screw. So what does this look like in real life? Well, um, this would be a um, production scale um, system. This is a Pharma 16 extruder from Thermal Fisher Scientific. Um, what you see is um, on the right-hand side the extruder with the feeder where the colleague is actually filling the powder into um, the feeding the hopper of the feeder. Then th this is where the extrusion happens. And then we have a conveyor, which is this middle box there. And so we actually convey the material to cool it down because it's a hot melt. And at the end, we have a pelletizer. If you would like to see this um, in more detail, we actually shared a link to a video. You should see it um, on attachments and links. And if you have a look on that website, you will see this system in operation, which is actually very interesting if you haven't seen an extruder before. 
So if you disassemble an extruder, this would be what it looks like. Um, now you can see a bench top system um, disassembled in all parts. Um, so at the top you see the base unit, um, which is actually the drive behind the screen. Um, and then there is a plate on which we actually would place then the barrel. And below you see the lower part of the barrel and the top part of the barrel. And on the lower part of the barrel, you see the uh, screws, the two screws lying inside. So what you see is, and this is something that is not really large, um, so all material contact parts are quite small. You can basically place them in the dishwasher easily. So how does this screw system work like? We have two, two screws we work with. I mentioned that before. Um, but these two screws, they do have some mixing effects, but you can improve it by changing the screw configuration. So basically what you have is a shaft. It's a hexagonal shaft. And on this shaft, you place the elements like pearls on a chain. So on the left-hand side, you see conveying elements, which really look like a screw. So these are for conveying of the material. And then on the right-hand side, you see this mixing or kneading elements. And they are like little paddles. And you can place these paddles with an angle, with an offset, offset angle to each other. If you, have, if you choose a, a small angle, then you will have more conveying behavior and less strong mixing behavior. And if you have, for example, a 90 degrees angle, as you can see on the lower right-hand side, this is a section where the material would, would fill up this section completely. It, will stay, it would stay there for a long time, and it would actually be mixed quite well. So with this angle, you have the possibility to change uh, the, the, the residence time within the screw, the amount of shear, the mechanical stress, and the mechanism of mixing. So this is a very flexible um, yeah, system that you can adapt to the, your material needs. OK, so far about the technology in general. Let's um, go into, let's have a look on some examples. So uh, first of all, a very general example that where you can actually see how solubility is enhanced. So what you see in this chart is um, the blood concentration in, um, in an in vivo study. And what you see here is the crystalline um, itraconazole, which is the active ingredient, um, in the, with a yellow curve. And you see the dissolution is actually not, not really happening. So we have very low solubility of the drug, and this is why um, you cannot see an increase in blood concentration. If we do a physical mixture of itraconazole with a solo plus, um, which is the polymer used here, you'll see a slight increase. Um, so the fact that this polymer is there is already improving bioavailability, but only if you really do the extrusion process, so you make the solid solution of itraconazole and solo plus, then you get this blue curve. So bioavailability is improved by the factor of 24, uh, 25. So a huge increase. Here is now more a more commercial um, example. So very famous uh, HIV drug, Caletra, um, works with two active ingredients. At the very beginning, um, the company FV was actually working with uh, soft gelatin capsules, and the patient had to take six of these capsules per day. Alternatively, there was a liquid formulation, but the capsules were huge, right? You can see them on the right-hand side. And all of this um, required refrigeration. So um, this, yeah, the, the product had to be cooled all the time. Then they reformulated it with um, hot melt extrusion. And what um, they achieved was uh, tablets, which are shown on the right hand, lower right-hand side. And the patient then only had to take four tablets per day. So they could reduce the pill burden. Um, and what they received was a completely room stable product, a room temperature stable product. So that's something that really proves the, or shows the potential of that technology. 
And there are many of other examples. I'm not going to show you, like, discuss all of this, but um, so this is not not only a technology that you can basically find in publications, you know, from from universities, but this is really something that is in the market already. So you have um, many many products all around with different indications. There is a wide range of polymers that are suitable for that technology that you can see in the um, on the right column. Um, so there, yeah. There are many examples that prove um, that this has really uh, market potential here. Okay, so then I would like to show you a little bit of further downstream processing that you can do. Um, this is a general slide that gives uh, an idea of different um, downstream uh, equipment that can be used. So, of course, inside the extruder, you do the compounding of the ingredients, and then you get a melt. The melt is um, pushed through the die. This is actually the mechanism of extrusion, pushing something through the die. And um, then you need, some, some, you need to do something with this melt. And um, if you watched the video, you saw that you have the possibility of working with a strand die. Um, I mentioned um, it on the picture before, so you can basically um, you know, cool down the melt and then pelletize it. Uh, then you would get these kind of pellets that you can see on the left picture. The typical size is between one to three millimeters. And um, yeah, after that, you could, you could basically put this directly into capsules if the um, pellets are really nice in shape. But many of the um, pharmaceutical um, polymers are quite brittle, so you, w you might ha have to do a milling step and then do a um, tableting um, step after that. Then you have the possibility to do a face cut pelletization. Face, face cut means you directly cut at the dye. So you actually cut the melt, and um, then you go into a cyclone, and you can round it a little. So you get more round-shaped pellets. You can work with a chill roll. I'll, I will just explain this in a later slide. And then you can have also um, a sheet takeoff system. So basically, you don't use a die which has a round um, hole, but a slit. And from that slit, you get a film, and then you can pull the film and wind it up, um, up uh, and um, yeah, produce such orally dispersible film. Then you can have you have the possibility of a direct um, shaping, such as um, if you work with injection molding. So you can directly make caplets that are quite dense. Um, so this is something you should consider here. But that would be a final product, and you can make really unique shapes with that. So um, the most important uh, downstream uh, equipment is basically a strand line or a chill roll. So first of all, discussing the strand line, I, I mentioned that before. So you have um, extrusion, conveying, and then pelletization. And um, you can actually adjust the knife speed or the blade speed um, for, of the pelletizer, and thus you can actually get different sizes of pellets. Um, so you yeah, can go all the way down to 0.5 millimeter pellets, um, basically, depending on, this, on the speed that you choose. And you can even go to, to work with micro pellets. And um, yeah, so if you, if you would like to have a face cut system and very, very round um, pellets, this is also possible. In comparison to that, um, you can work with a chill roll system. Um, this is shown on that picture. So you have an extruder on the right-hand side, and then left of it, this is the chill roll. And if you go a little um, yeah, further, we can see what, what's the function here. You have the melt, and the melt is basically squeezed in between two chilled rolls. The nice thing is here you have a very distinct cool down of the system, and um, then um, this kind of sheet that is produced here goes into a flaker unit that makes irregular shaped flakes. So that's um, on that picture here. On the right hand side, you can see there's some little irregular shaped flakes. Um, the nice thing is here, this allows very easy milling because the flakes are quite thin. And um, thus you get um, yeah, a nice powder for tableting. The advantages, if you work with, with such a um, chill roll, first of all, is actually not mentioned here, but you can actually reach quite high throughputs um, on the production scale extruder here. Um, you have a very controlled cooling, which is necessary for some solid solutions to be stable. So this is um, 
this has been proved to improve um, stability of uh, solid dispersion. You get you can fastly cool it down. You get you have a smaller footprint because this the setup is uh, smaller, and it's suitable if you have a very brittle material. So that's actually something you would use if the material is very brittle to actually um, yeah, shape it into a way that you can easily mill it. Um, yeah, and uh, with this, I would like um, to give you a little bit more outlook on other dosage forms that are possible. So I think both of the talks mostly re were related to sol solid oral dosage forms. So it's, this is something what you see at the top, at the top. So make tablets or capsule capsules um, for solid oral application. With a hot melt extruder, you can also do ointments or transdermal patches. So transdermal um, dosage form is possible. You can you can make um, these kind of rings, for example, for transmucosal application. Uh, a very famous example is the Nuva ring here. Then on the left-hand side here, lower left-hand side, you see subcutaneous um, dosage forms. This means that you can have, you can make injectable implants. So you basically just shape little rods that are filled with active ingredient, and you can inject this into, an, for example, human arm. So the patient has a constant release um, in a sub subcutaneous application. And then, last but not least, on the um, mid-left side, you see buccal application. A typical um, um, system here would be uh, orally dispersible film, for example. So all of this can be extruded, and all of this can be done on the same piece of equipment. You would just need some accessories for that. OK, with this, I would like to conclude that talk. So I hope you've You've seen that twin screw extrusion is a versatile technology enabling R&D and production at different dosage forms and formulations, and all of, all of it is possible on the same piece of equipment. Hot melt extrusion itself improves bioavailability, um, firstly by improving solubility in most cases, depending on the um, formulation you would like to work with. It's a continuous manufacturing process, so uh, it has all the advantages of continuous manufacturing in comparison to batch processes. Of course, it's fully GMP compliant, and you can easily and fast, quickly clean, clean the complete equipment. It has a very small footprint, and it's reliable in up and down scaling. So this is something I did not mention here, but, but because the scales are actually really comparable to a production scale, you can have easy calculation and then scale it up um, and be fast in, in uh, going into production. It's a very modular setup, so you can actually um, yeah, work with different downstream processing, for example, and as mentioned, various dosage forms are possible. OK, so thank you for your attention. If you would be interesting in, interested in a bit more uh, details on and different applications, check out our web page, which is uh, at, thermofisher.com drug formulation. There we have many application um, notes and uh, technical data sheets where you can have more details on that. Thank you, Dr. Richter. Now we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar. But once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions in via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. So now our first question will be for, for you, Dr. Jeremy. Although there is a lot of research on HME processing, there is a limit of number of commercial products. What is your opinion of why HME's potential has not been fully exploited? OK, thank you very much. Um, I think there are a few reasons. And uh, although we see the re in recent years that uh, there is a, a, a steady number of uh, products in the market and uh, uh, gradually increase, uh, there are a few reasons. The first, you know, to my opinion, is that uh, uh, a lot of people in the pharmaceutical industry were not familiar with uh, the process, so they, they could see uh, HME as a black box. And uh, it was after 2010, we saw uh, a huge increase in uh, research, uh, both from academia and uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry. Uh, a second uh, reason is that um, uh, traditionally, pharmaceutical uh, industry is a bit conservative. They, they trust traditional approaches, and they are not very keen to move to uh, new, novel, or, or 
uh, other processes uh, which are not well known. Uh, so, for that reason, there was only a limited number of companies that had uh, a very good knowledge in uh, whole metal extrusion, uh, mainly in uh, Germany and in the uh, US. Uh, and that's why we, we saw that uh, uh, slowly other companies, they wait to see some uh, uh, products uh, will be commercialized or marketed, and then they will uh, start uh, um, uh, having interest in uh, whole metal extrusion. And uh, also, a more, a more scientific uh, uh, reason is that uh, quite often when we talk with people, they, they are also familiar with the whole metal extrusion, uh, uh, we get this response that uh, uh, farm people from industry, they are uh, a bit skeptical about the stability of uh, solid dispersions. There is a lot of concern how stable uh, the solid dispersions uh, could be, and they are, they are not uh, uh, they are not wrong. This is uh, uh, this is one of the issues with whole metal extrusion. Uh, so I think these three reasons are uh, made uh, whole metal extrusion uh, not to uh, fully exploit it so far. But uh, like I said in the beginning, we see more and more products uh, going to the market. Thank you. Our next question uh, is: How much material is needed, and what is a typical batch size for a lab scale extruder? Uh, Dr. Richter, would you like to take this? Yes. So this is a very typical question. So if you start with a very small extruder, um, I think the lowest you you could go with is something like 20 grams um, of the compound or of the of the pre blend, for example. So lower than this um, is also possible if you um, only do a feasibility study. So if you're not too much focusing on the um, process parameters, I actually ha I think I have um, some slides. Oh no, here. This one is actually showing the throughputs that are typical um, for. So the Pharma 11 would be a lab scale extruder. 20 gram per hour up to 3 kilogram per hour is something you would do in, a, in this continuous process. So I would always try to, to look for one hour operation to have startup to you know prove some or check some settings and then um, yeah one hour 20 gram is the minimum and if you go to higher uh, values then you can go yeah of course up to you know, seven ki 70 kilogram per hour um, on the on the production scale extruder and on the back of that question. Uh, what are the crucial process parameters in hot melt extrusion? Excuse me, could you repeat it? Uh, what are the crucial process parameters in hot melt extrusion? So um, typically, uh, this is something I also have in the backup slide here. So typically, you um, you can change continuously during the process is running the screw speed and the feed rate into the extruder the barrel temperature and the die temperature. So these are very common settings that you can change. Um, if you're, um, and these are really crucial to the process. So for example, um, if you change the feed rate a lot, the residence time within the extruder will also change a lot. Um, and um, then you can also do step changes, such as um, you could change the screw design, so the screw configuration that I explained before. This will also highly influence your, your product um, in the end. And the dependent parameters on that are what's, what's the melt temperature, what's the melt pressure and the torque um, of the drive, and what is the residence time for how long is the material actually during processing, um, how long is it, does it take to, to perform the process. And um, this means that the material is actually uh, you know, processed at this elevated temperature. So this is, of course, something is, which is really crucial, especially in pharmaceutical um, applications because most of the active or many of the active ingredients are quite sensitive to heat. So you would like to, you know, have as long residence time as needed to actually process the material and to receive the solid dispersion, but as short as needed in order to not have any degradation happening. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Durami. What are the current trends in pharmaceutical industry regarding HME usage for new products? Right, uh, we see a lot of uh, interest from uh, at the moment from industry. On uh, there are actually two main areas. One is uh, classical solid dispersions.
uh, but we see a lot of uh, interaction, a lot of interest of uh, pharmaceutical industry in uh, the use uh, of uh, extrusion for uh, uh, the formation of co-crystals. Uh, with recent uh, uh, changes in uh, FDA regulations, uh, we, we found a lot of companies uh, uh, going to that area, and we currently, for example, we work with uh, several companies, try to develop uh, uh, co-crystals mainly produced by whole metal extrusion. So I would say these are the two main areas. Of course, there is a, a lot of interest in the uh, extrusion granulation, but um, I'm not very convinced that um, this is... Uh, uh, this is a process that um, uh, it's, it's, of course, a continuous process, but uh, we haven't seen anything uh, yet that uh, it will lead to a commercial product. Thank you. Our next question, HME processing leads to loss of compressibility of material. Uh, do you recommend any specific way to improve this aspect? Dr. Richard, would you like to answer this first? Yes, yeah, sure. So. Um, if you say loss of comp compressibility, this means, of course, you have, if you do, if you make the melt, the melt is actually super dense. So basically you cannot compress it anymore at all. And um, what you typically do then is you mill, you mill it down. And um, if you work with a mill, um, you will get, of course, more porous, more um, compressible product then. And uh, what we found is this really depends a lot on the excipients you use for the process. And there are many excipients available that really improve um, your tabletability. So you will get really nice products with that. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, audience members, for your questions. Unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for. Before I finish the webinar, I would like to ask our presenters, Dennis and Marguerite, if they have any closing remarks. Dennis. I would like to thank uh, all of you for your time and your attention, and uh, I was very glad to present uh, our work. And Mark Reef, do you have any closing remarks? No, just thank you a lot. Um, that was uh, very interesting. I think also with Professor Durham, it's a um, good combination here um, to introduce this technology. Thanks for your interest. Well, thank you. thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters once again. That was Dennis Durumi, Professor in Pharmaceutical Technology and Process Engineering at University of Greenwich, and Dr. Marguerite Richler, Pharma Application Specialist at Thermo Fisher Scientific, for sharing their knowledge with us. I would also like to remind our audience that you can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. And if you are watching this on demand, then please feel free to send your questions over to me at stephen dot edwards at biopharma-asia.com, and we'll get those answers to you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.